you are worthy and we stand in your presence this evening acknowledging that you alone are worthy of our worship of our praise of our lives God we offer them to you in your presence on this gathering God in this gathering as we gather together as um, we remind ourselves of the great sacrifice at the cross during this passion week I pray that just as you've been speaking to us you would continue to speak to us you see your word is life to us if you don't speak to us God we would be dead would be like that hopeless completely and yet you are a god who does not leave us in a hopeless situation who don't want to leave us in that kind of state you are a god who is set his eyes upon us your ears are open to our cries you see deep in our heart to think like that that a god who pays attention to people like us Thank you God that you gave us this privilege on this day to worship you and as we spend time in your presence would you speak to us would you continue to minister to us teach us God more and more bless you in Jesus name we pray amen amen keep standing good evening thank you for joining us today would you turn your bibles to Luke chapter 7 this evening and we will read um the word of God and then of course we will look into what God wants to teach us this evening all of you who took time to be here with us and of course those who are joining us online we want to thank God uh for all of you to express this grace um chapter 7 of Luke verses 36 one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him is touching him, she is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts, Simon. He said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 550 pieces to another. But uh, neither of them could repay. He loved him more after that. Simon uh, answered I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, "Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them. A person who is forgiven little shows only little love." Then Jesus said to the woman, "Your sins are forgiven." The men at the table said among themselves, "Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins?" And Jesus said to the woman, "Your faith has saved you. Go in peace." You may be seated. This week we are talking about the tables that um the tables where Jesus had spent time and uh, um, in conversations with people and in his conversations how he expressed the grace of god as it is with this multi dimensional um um you know shape the grace of god obviously cannot be understood just by one single definition and we do need to keep looking at uh the scriptures uh, to understand it in much more 
uh, clear essence, and that's the uh, premise of this entire season called At the Table, and we are looking at um, uh, Jesus' conversations with people, how he changed their lives, and uh, how he showed God's grace to them. Um, each of these tables were spent with a variety of people. We saw he spent with a tax collector on day one, and then we saw another tax collector who ultimately became his disciple. And today we see a Pharisee with whom Jesus is spending. Um, it's, it's really interesting. You would see more Pharisees spending time at the table with Jesus, um, complaining that he's spending time with sinners more. That's, um, that's really interesting. Uh, all through the Gospels. So here is a Pharisee whose name, very interestingly, is mentioned. Uh, there are a lot of Pharisees with whom Jesus had held conversations. Pharisees with whom Jesus spoke. Uh, many Pharisees who had questioned Jesus about his authority, about his teaching and all that. You would see that all through the Gospels. And um, here is uh, the only Pharisee who is actually mentioned by name, um, you know, uh, by the mouth of Jesus. Uh, of course, we, we know there is a Nicodemus and Joseph the Arimathea, but they are exceptions because they are kind of followers of Jesus. But um, the rest of the Pharisees who, uh, who spent time with Jesus were primarily targeting Jesus and trying to corner him. And it's almost as if Jesus loves the challenge and he spends time with them, purposefully breaking rules right in front of their eyes. Uh, we will look at tomorrow another uh, Pharisee's home where he spent time breaking a rule right in front of their eyes. Uh, purposefully as if to antagonize them and in, in, in antagonizing them, teaching them about the grace itself. And today, uh, here at this, uh, th this is a very plain passage. You kind of, uh, well, uh, straightforward, it's, it's a very straightforward uh, uh, incident uh, that is recorded by Luke, which, which teaches multiple things to us. Um, it teaches about how God forgives us. It uh, teaches to us about how do we need to worship God uh, how gratitude, if it is expressed in worship, how God receives our gratitude and worship, uh, specifically when we offer worship to Him, uh, that costs us most. Um, actually, for her, it would have costed all her life savings when she brought the alabaster jar of oil. Um, it, it was, she would have had to pay a lot to get that um, perfume uh, and then break it right in front of G, uh, you know, people and and pour that uh, um, um, perfume over the feet of Jesus um, almost feels like wastage of all her life savings. And yet, it's the act of worship that kind of moved the heart of Jesus. And we'll talk about it a little more. So, oh, we see this story. We know what is happening there. We can kind of figure out um, this passage teaches uh, us about worship, teaches us about how do we express our gratitude, how God responds to gratitude, how God responds to worship, you know, it's, it's pre pretty much plain and clear to us in this. But I want to spend a little more time focusing on the woman itself and the background from where she came and the things that surrounding her and what Jesus said to her kind of caught me by surprise and that's what I want to uh, focus on. It was verse 50 that um, I, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of impressed upon my heart the word that Jesus told her as he looked at her and said, your faith has saved you, now go in peace. It's, a, um, it's very interesting that at no other place, Jesus said that to a sinful person. Remember this. There are a lot of places where Jesus encountered sinful people, like her prostitutes and, and sinners and adulterers. Uh, even uh, people who were sick, uh, whom Jesus healed. Um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back, we talked about this guy who had been sick all his life and spent time for 38 years in, uh, at Bethesda, Pool of Bethesda. And how after Jesus healed him, uh, Jesus set him free and he has gone out and um, uh, Jesus meets him later and speaks to him and tells him, listen, sin no more. He heals a blind man at the temple, a uh, born blind man, and tells him, sin no more. He chooses not to stone an adulterous woman who everybody wanted to kill, uh, and tells her, 
I, I won't uh, 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 stone you too. Uh, now go back and sin no more. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a repeated statement that Jesus speaks whenever he speaks to sick people and sinners. But here is the only occasion where Jesus doesn't talk about sin, doesn't mention sin. Um, in the sense of to her. And telling her, I want you to go back in peace. He didn't say sin no more. He simply said, go back in peace. It's that word that kind of gives us a hint as to the kind of turmoil this woman must have been experiencing when she came into this Pharisee's house. The kind of hurt she must have been experiencing have experienced in our life. It is, uh, if there is one thing that I've learned in life, um, um, uh, it is this, that at some point all of us get hurt. All of us carry some kind of sorrow within, deep within our, our hearts that um, we don't share with others. We all have problems, we all go through pains, but we all have hidden wounds too. These emotional scars that um, scarred us for life, which um, are not easy to forget, not easy to wipe off. Um, things that we don't allow anybody else to see. We don't share it with even our family members. We don't share it with even our spouses. There may be some things that we have experienced in life about whom we are mum about. We don't talk about them. It's too painful to even think about. Places, um, even uh, the mention of those places are, um, are that kind of atmosphere causes pain to us. That memory is that strong. This woman, I kind of feel, is a woman who is deeply hurt, emotionally scarred, uh, very deeply wounded. How do I know that? The, the way she expressed herself at the feet of Jesus. This is the only woman you see crying a lot without saying a word. Remember this. There are people who cried out to Jesus, asking Jesus what they want from him. Remember the guy who was uh, sitting on the roadside when Jesus was walking, calling, calling out to Jesus, son, Jesus, son of David, uh, son of man, would you heal me? There are a lot of people who came to Jesus, crying out to Jesus, saying, would you heal my son? He is demon possessed, crying out to Jesus. There are a lot of people who cried in the presence of Jesus. But they all knew why they were crying. They could express their uh, pain. They could express, they could tell why they are crying. Here is one woman who doesn't utter a word crying. Just crying. You do that in only two occasions. One, when you are worshipping. Number two, when you are in deep pain. When you don't know how to say this. When you don't know how to verbalize what you're going through, the kind of turmoil that you're experiencing. And I kind of feel this woman expressed her pain through her tears. I wonder what caused that kind of deep pain in her. That kind of tra in her trauma within her. I don't know. I'm, I can only assume there must be some things that have happened in her life. We kind of try and oh, you know, figure out that along the way today. First of all, Luke calls her immoral woman. It's funny that Luke chooses to name the Pharisee, not the woman. Um, she, she, he introduces us as immoral person. What Simon thought about her would tell her, tell us what people think about her. Simon looked at her, in his mind is thinking, if only he knows what kind of sinner this person is. Yesterday we saw the real words people use for those kind of people um, in chapter 5 at Matthew's table. Pharisees were looking at all these sinners sitting around uh, along with tax collectors uh, with whom Jesus was sitting and he called, they called them scum. Th th those are the kind of opinions people had about sinners, specifically people like this woman. Um... As I was thinking about it, I, 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 start, I, I, you know, I, I wondered what, what causes deep and emotional scars inside us. I could tell at least three reasons. There could be more reasons, 
but let me just three tell three reasons why uh, most of us are emotionally scarred or deeply wounded one because of the way others treat us for many of us as we grew up there may be times and occasions or it could be a consistent experience in our life as you grew up as you are growing up where people ill treated you it could be the way they spoke to you sometimes people don't have to say words the way they look at us itself conveys a meaning to us how the kind of opinion that they have towards us the way they behave with us um wh- wh- whether the words that they spoke whether the actions they committed with you in uh, you know in, in in your interactions with them you could see the disgust in their faces against you you could see the disgust in the thoughts simon held towards her if only he knows what she has done and what kind of woman she is simon was thinking the things that people would have done to us physically emotionally um um uh, even spiritually for that matter uh, shaming us in front of others that uh, would have caused deep wound which usually doesn't go away just like that so uh, we could be emotionally scarred and deeply wounded because of the way people treated us or because of the way people betrayed us when you talk about betrayal you're talking about people doing something behind you not in front of you but behind you so treatment is in front of you but betrayal is behind you most of us have have some have some kind of experience with betrayals i mean nobody is spared of betrayal even jesus was not spared a betrayal we'll talk about betrayals on good friday and how deeply it can hurt people um i i'm i'm sure she must have been betrayed in her life the way people um uh, mock us not in front of us but behind us the way people would have branded her would have deeply hurt her some of us have brands we are being branded by people um uh, that we become aware of and we feel hurt you see if our enemy says something ab- against us about us it's one thing if we already know that person is an enemy but what if people we trust what if people we share with have fun with have chai with are the ones who are talking behind us and making fun of us mock making mockery of us how deeply that would hurt us um you trust them you thought they were your friends you thought but then you get to know the kind of things that they said the kind of things they did they would uh, in front of you cheer you on but behind you pull you back uh the way they denigrated you uh would hurt it it would scar uh, it would scar us for life by the way i'm sure she she knew what people talked about her you see sometimes people talk about us without knowing our, our true condition i was thinking about this woman and i thought who which woman in in her right sense would decide to sell her body for money there's a difference between an adulterous woman and a prostitute we need to understand the difference between those two an adulterous woman is somebody who is following her evil desire to be sexually satisfied so she would sleep around but a prostitute is selling her body for money when a woman comes to a place where she is selling her body for money 
Imagine the kind of desperation she must have been to come to a place where she thinks that I've got no other option but this. I mean, I got no other doors open. Either she's forcefully pushed into that kind of profession or she doesn't have an option but to sell her body. Now, people don't know that. Outside, people would never know why a person would end up in a, pro in a profession like that. Nobody would know. I'm definitely sure Simon doesn't know. And so people could say 101 things about her. She, she, she probably wondered, I if only they know why I'm here. If only they know what kind of desperation desperate situation I'm in. It's easy for us to sit on the other side of the fence and judge by saying, I would never do that, even if I'm in that kind of desperate situation. But you never know. And so when people do that to us, we would be scarred. Of course we would be scarred. Deep inside. Wounded. The branding that she got, immoral woman. That's how Luke introduced her, immoral woman. The branding that others gave, scum. The branding the people give us. Then of course, I think, uh, another reason why we, we would be emotionally scarred would be the kind of bitter experiences that we would experience in life. There could be physical abuse. There could have been a mental abuse, a spiritual abuse, as I said. People you trusted, people you believed in. It's one thing to be abused by people you don't know. It's another thing to be abused by people you believe and trust where you think, in this relationship I have safety. Especially in relationships where we think there is safety for us and we get abused there physically or emotionally or spiritually, that would scar us. Then we hear stories of uncles who abused, uh, fathers who abused, mothers who abused, uh, you know, relationships friends who abused, people we thought would, we would be safe with them are the ones who would abuse us. It could be sodomy, it could be deception, it could be uh, betrayal, I don't know, I'm just saying. The trauma, the trauma those experiences would cause us would stay with us. They would make us never to trust people again. An emotionally scarred person would not be able to trust anybody and that's why they would live in isolation. Even though they are among people, they are always isolated. You could recognize them easily. You would know them. Sometimes we don't know actually. They may be smiling all around and but complete isolation in their mind. No fellowship, no relationship. They don't like to get into deeper relationships because they know the kind of experience that they've had before and they would isolate themselves. You see, basically my point is this. When you have experiences like this, when you keep hearing words like this or uh, um, branded like that, uh, you, you lose your self-esteem. A person who loses their self-esteem become lonely, choose to be isolated, um, they would be the ones who are emotionally scarred, deeply wounded. You know, I kind of feel she didn't care what anybody thinks when she came to Jesus. Because she knew what they would be thinking about her. Because she knew what they would be saying about her. And she felt like, I don't care, I just need somebody to heal me at this point of time. No prostitute would dare step into a Pharisee's home. The fact that she ended up in a Pharisee's home shows the kind of desperation she was in. There's a possibility that she could be thrown out. There's a possibility that she would be found out. I guess it was too late before Simon realized, oh, 
they, 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 this is that person. You know, by the time Simon could realize, she must have been already at the feet of Jesus, crying and, you know, wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair and breaking the alabaster jar and, pour, jar and pouring out the perfume upon the feet of Jesus. So he must have thought, that's too late, and I wish this guy know who she is. And here is something that I kind of realized, that most of us who are emotionally scarred choose to remain like that. Not because we want to be, but because we feel like we got no other option. Why? Because I kind of think, growing up as, as we grew up, whatever people said about us, to us, become the words, those words become the markers by which we live. We choose to live by what people told us, about us. You are stupid. You never amount to anything. You never do anything right. You're always clumsy, you're no good, you can't do anything right. You're fat, you're ugly, you're weird, you're black, you're fat so, you're pencil neck, you're loser, you're a shorty. Now these words will remain within us, you know, they, they don't go away. They will become the markers by which we kind of fix our life. This is how I'm going to live like. Those distorted images which people presented to us about us, uh, become the standard by which we choose to live our lives. And that's why the people who are emotionally scarred would, um, would come to a place where they think, because of all the wrong information they received, because of all the trauma that they have experienced personally, they would come to a place where we think our lives, are, our lives have no value. That we begin to believe, the moment we think we have no value for our lives, then we begin to believe that we are unrepairable. That nobody can mend us now. We, we are too broken, uh, nobody can mend us. I wonder the, if that's what she was feeling there as she cried and just like Simon, maybe she's thinking, if only you know what kind of person I am. If only you know how unrepairable I am. I'm irreparable. There's no way I can, I can be mended. I'm broken too much. It's one thing to have a crack and then find a glue to close that crack. I'm too broken to even to try and piece my life together. It's, it's not possible. Uh, 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 the moment we begin to believe that, that we are unrepairable, we conclude that our lives are unlovable. If people know, I don't think anybody would even love a person like me. But here, in that place, you would see how the healing grace of God works. Psalmist must have experienced quite a bit of that kind of healing in his own personal life. He goes on to say, God heals the brokenhearted and he binds their wounds. In other words, he's saying, you may think you are irreparable, but God can repair you. Repair you so well that the scars won't be there anymore to remind you of your past. To remind you of your trauma. They won't be there anymore. You see, not only God can blot out our transgressions, he can even blot out our traumatic experiences. Do you know that? He can do that. The pain that she must have been going through and the trauma that she must have been going through, Jesus would have seen it. How Jesus dealt with her there, he's at Simon's table. How Jesus dealt with her shows how healing grace of God works. You never pay attention to a single, 
a, a particular detail in that in that verse, you know, in that story. Most of us pay attention to the alabaster jar. Or Simon's thoughts. Or the sins that are forgiven. Of course, sins that are forgiven. We'll come to that. But there is something that is very subtle that Luke records, which we should pay attention to. Verses 44. When Simon thought, whatever he's thinking, right? Simon thought something. He thought, if only he knows what kind of woman this is. And then Jesus gave this parable talking to Simon. Simon, let me tell you a story. And he tells this story and asks him, what do you think? And Simon answers and he says, yeah, you're right. In your answer, you're right. Then he, look at that verse, verses 44. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman, but talking to Simon. You, you got to pay attention to that. He turned to the woman, but he's talking to Simon. He's not talking to her. But his eyes are on her. His attention, complete attention is on her. She must have thought, nobody's paying attention to me. Until that point, she was not even sure whether Jesus knows what she was doing there. Maybe, I'm just assuming. Because the way they sit, unlike how we are sitting on the table, the way they sit in Middle East, if you see Arab culture, you'd see that the table would be much more lower, and the way they sit would be, their legs would be out, right? As they almost reclining onto the table with legs completely um, stretched out. And Jesus had a lot of people around that table. And as he sat down there, and of course leaning onto the table, he must be talking to Simon until that point, or maybe teaching something. I don't know what he was doing at that point in time. But until he turned to her, there is a high possibility that she must have been thinking, he doesn't even know what I'm doing here. Now he's looking at her, but talking to Simon. Simon! You have never valued me as I came into your home. You invited me as the guest of honor. But you didn't even show the courtesy of me being your guest of honor treating me with the way you're supposed to treat as the culture demands. Jewish culture is that when you invite a, a person to your home as a guest of honor, the first thing that you would do as you come and recline at the table is have one of your servants wash their feet. It's a tradition that they're supposed to do. Wash their feet and the servants would wipe their feet or if the house does not, cannot afford a servant, they themselves would do it. The host themselves would do it. Wash their feet and wipe their uh, feet. Then they would take a, pe a pinch of olive oil and place it upon their head. As if to say, you, the, you are an anointed one and we are glad that you are our guest in our home. Showing the kind of respect that they would show to a prophet or a king. It doesn't matter who the guest is, whether they are king or prophet doesn't really matter. When they are in the house as a guest of honor, that's the kind of treatment Jews are supposed to give to their guests. Jesus is reminding Simon, Simon, you invited me to your home to be your guest, but you did not even value my presence. But look at this woman. She thought nobody was paying attention. Maybe Simon thought nobody is paying attention because that's why he thought, if only he knows the kind of person that is touching him. Jesus, as he turned his face towards her, instead of turning to Simon, addressing his question, he's looking at her and he's almost as if to tell her, listen, it doesn't matter what they value you as. You are more valuable than you think you are. I place value to, on you. 
when god looks at you and says you're valuable it should change our life completely first thing jesus did as he turned his face toward her is to reveal the kind of value he placed places upon her we are of great value because of god's grace doesn't matter if people think we are stupid doesn't matter if we, people think we are good for nothing god places a value upon us you see our value is not because of us not because of what we own our value is because of who owns us let's talk about value itself the value of anything is determined by who owns that particular thing or what at what price it would be bought for remember those two things that's the value quotient let's assume um the, 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 this article i mean just for the sake of analogy i'm using this Let's say I bought this for 500 rupees. I like it. I value it. It stays on my dining table. Um but really it doesn't mean anything to you. Any one of you. It doesn't really mean anything to you. I could say oh, I love the way it looks. You may just for the sake of conversation you say yeah yeah it looks nice you don't really care it has no value in your sight you probably think i can buy that as long as it remains on my table it has of no it is of no value except for me it has is of no value to anybody else so when i die and if if it comes to auction nobody is going to buy it for more than 500 rupees or you might actually buy it for lesser than that and if i have my ill ill reputed person the value of this would go even down but what if the same article this same article is on the table of the president of india there's something about it that changes the substance never changed it's the same article suddenly it becomes a thing of value because of who owns it isn't that's why we are crazy about buying shirts worn by shahrukh khan or i don't know who is the new great hero right now but whatever uh, uh, houses that they are lived in or beds that they slept on cars that they drove it's just an ordinary car it's just an ordinary house anybody could buy the same kind of build the same kind of house and yet we would place higher value simply because who owns it that's the point same article as long as it is with me it has no value but if it changes hands and goes into somebody like president of india then it changes the value changes the way it is treated changes completely who it belongs to changes its value imagine you want to go and meet um, our cm revant reddy um you have no appointment no prior appointment or even if you do have an appointment and you go to the office the way the guy at the office reception desk would treat you would be totally different he doesn't care he is in the presence of revant reddy every single day you are the stranger here you are an ordinary person when you come there even a pune you would talk very carefully right you treat them as their ias officers uh, because you know you getting entry into that place that room is in their hands so you treat them well they don't have to treat you well they don't necessarily have to care about you and you go there they would stop you from entering into the into the office 
but imagine Raven Reddy passing you by and then sees you and says, hey, he's my friend. If he says that, instantly the guy who's been stopping you until that point, the way he treats you from that moment changes completely. It's a different... Now he knows you're a friend of Raven Reddy. You are not no more ordinary person. And so when you go inside, uh, the way he brings water now, the brain he, br- he brings coffee now to you, would be totally different. The way they treat you now is, is a little different. Because of the, per- the kind of relationship you have with the CM. Then, what if that particular person, you, are son of Raven Reddy? But the Pune doesn't know that. And you are trying to get entry into that place, you couldn't. Because he thinks you are just an ordinary kid or somebody and the way he treats you would be totally different. Until somebody informs him, hey, he's the son of Raven Reddy. Now the treatment is completely different. From that moment, how they talk to you, how they behave in front of you, how uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 they value you is totally different because of the person to whom you belong to. You see what I'm saying? By looking at her, that's what Jesus, uh, Jesus is trying to show to Simon. Simon, I value her more than you. You didn't even value me. Look at this woman. Look at the kind of respect that she's showing towards me. She doesn't even know whether I value her. By looking at her, he is trying to tell her, not to her, not to Simon. He's telling her non-verbally, I value you. I see what you have done. I see what's happening in your heart. I see you. Value. He owns us, you see. That's why John says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 4, he says, you belong to God, he says. You belong to God, my dear children. So you won victory over all these people already. Because the spirit of God who lives inside you is greater than the spirit that lives in this world. The one who is inside you sealed you as a child of God. And that seal is the expression of God's opinion about you. The value he placed upon you. The second value quotient, of course, of something or someone is what someone would be willing to pay for this article. Not how much with which, with which is bought, how much it can be sold for. If someone is willing to pay 5,000 rupees to this, then the value is 5,000 rupees. If someone is willing to pay 10,000 rupees for this, then the value is 10,000 rupees. See what I'm saying? Whatever you are willing to pay for something, you are determining the value of that. Sometimes you are, you know, we, we, we buy some things and, and tell others, hey, I bought it for a really cheap price. Huh? You, you would say that, right? But actually, it's not how much you saved, it's how much you spent determines the value of that, that thing that you bought. So whatever value you place on this to buy, that reminds this value. How much are we worth then? Those of us who hurt, who are hurt, deeply wounded, we must listen to this. How much are we worth? Some of us think that even if I put one rupee on my head and I stand in auction, nobody would buy me. That's what we think. But how much are we worth? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter, 20, chapter 6, verses 20, you are bought at a price. What's the price? What's the price? 
Christ Jesus is the price. God bought you, brought, bought you with a price. The price is he paid with his son. He paid with his son. His son's broken body, his son's blood that was shed on the cross is the price that God pays for you. God pays for our lives, our lives, the lives everybody looks at and says, this guy is good for nothing. Our lives, people who are branding us and calling us useless fellows, sinners, immoral person, adulterer. Our lives, God values it so much that he was willing to pay with his son in exchange. Value. Not only to whom we belong to, but the kind of price for which we were sold, we were bought with shows the kind of value God places on us. Don't ever let anyone talk you down. Don't ever let what others say about you stop believing this. There are so many people who would have said so many things that broke our hearts, including our parents. We felt devalued. We felt worthless. But God says, but that's not the case. I value you. I value you so much that I can pay with my son for you. As he looked at her, not only he revealed her value to her, he revealed her value to everybody around her. That's why for me, it's very important that Jesus looked at the woman but talking to Simon. It's almost as if to tell Simon, Simon, I don't care what you think about her. I value her. He revealed that to Simon and to her. Same time. And in that, he also expressed his love for her. Her sins are many. I know she's a sinful woman. Her sins are many, but her love is much more. Look at what Jesus chose to look at. That's what people who love us look at. No wonder Paul says, love covers all sins. It's not hiding the sin. It's like, that, that's the expression Paul is trying to give to us. Listen, love covers all sins. It's not because not that love will hide sin. Jesus was not hiding her sin. He said, her sins are many, he said. Isn't that what he said? Her sins are many. But her love is more. His love for her ignored her sin and looked at her heart. That's how we choose to see our children too, right? That's how we see to choose the people we love. We would ignore their faults. We, we, we would ignore their flaws. Not that we would discount their flaws and faults or their sin. But we would not let what they did to us stop us from loving them because our love is much more than what they have done to us normally you know, when we love somebody. So that's why Jesus, what he said uh, to Simon regarding her and reminding Simon as to why he loves him less, values him less. Her sin is more. But I know she loves me more. That means I should value her more. You see, he revealed his love to us through his word and through his son. We, we already know this, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. He revealed his love to us through his word. Isaiah chapter 54. Let me read two verses for you and so, and then I move on. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, 
yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace would be removed says the lord who has compassion on you multiple times in the scripture god reveals his love for us you are chosen you are loved i know you by your name you are the apple of my eye i have written i have i have written your name on the palm of my hand i have plans and purposes for your life again and again all through the scripture god keeps reminding us don't listen to people too many voices around you too many voices around you listen to the voice of truth you are precious in my sight i pay ransom for you i came to seek and save you your sins are forgiven his word consistently reminds us of that there's a beautiful song i think it's by casting crowns if i'm not wrong called voice of truth there are too many voices in this world that keep telling us deciding what our worth is and who we are but let's choose to ignore that those voices and listen to the voice of truth but the voice of truth tells me a different story the song goes on it tells me a different story it tells me that i'm loved i'm i i i i am uh, you know precious his word through his word and through his son john further down in 1 john chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says this this is how god showed his love among us he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins you see we hear we hear these things so many times we don't let the, the 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 importance of those words get our attention we listen to all those voices that are not at all important that have that don't play with value on us and we kind of take those words at their face value instead of these words that scripture shows talks about us say one thing is for sure these words says remind us that god's love is consistent and god's love is un- unconditional and then of course the healing grace of god elevates our status elevates our status he, i'm 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 still sticking to him looking at the woman okay remember that because the, the way he looked at her tells me all this i value you i love you and i'm going to show all these fellows how much i love you he elevated her status immediately in front of all those people whatever the opinions of people are let's listen to the opinion of god about you from sinner she has become forgiven the f- that's the first thing he told her right your sins are forgiven from a sinner she has become a forgiven person he blotted out he blots out our trans- isaiah chapter 43 verses 25 says this he blots out our transgressions for his own sake i blot out your transgressions for, for my own sake and i will not remember your sins anymore maybe that's what he's telling her when he said your sins are forgiven he's saying stop worrying about those sins you're forgiven but he doesn't stop there he elevated her 
from being a condemned person to be an absolved person. From condemnation to absolution. You know the difference, right? She was a condemned woman, immoral woman, sinner. Everybody is talking about what they are saying to us is the condemnation. But when he said, I, your sins are forgiven, he's telling her, you're absolved of all your sins. Whatever you have done up to this point, everything is absolved. Meaning, you don't face consequences for this anymore. It's not going to hurt you anymore. It's going to be removed, wiped out, clean, quiet. You see, our sins are ultimately against God. No matter what we have done, we basically sinned against God. And so therefore, only God can blot out our transgressions. Only God can set us free completely, acquit us. So when we place our trust in Him, like this woman did, then there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Not those who walk according to the flesh, but those who walk according to the spirit. And then of course, he elevated our status from rejection to a relation. She was a rejected person. But by choosing to focus his eyes on her, he's saying, now you enter into a relationship with me. This is the most important one. Forget about everybody else. From rejection into relationship. That's why he looks at her and says, now go in peace. Now go in peace. When you experience that grace, you would realize how God can heal us. It will be amazing. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. The healing grace of God. The trauma causes a lot of pain to us. But the healing grace of God takes that pain away. Slowly. If you resist more, it may be a little more longer. But if you simply come like her and just fall at the feet of Christ, it will be faster. One thing don't miss out in this passage. What's, what Jesus said to Simon. Her sins were many and they were forgiven. That's why she loved me. Isn't that what Jesus told? Her sins were many. They were forgiven. That's why... She showed so much love to me. He is talking in past tense. Our sins are forgiven, so therefore she is loving me. But in the present, he tells her, your sins are forgiven now. It's amazing. Even before he told her, I forgive you, he already forgave her in the past. Maybe the time she bought the alabaster jar of oil, Jesus saw that already and for chase, chose to forgive her. All this rest of the action was allowing her to come into his presence, allowing everybody else to see how healing grace of God works. Your sins are already forgiven. <laughs> Remember yesterday I told you about Peter? Peter, you're going to betray me. But I already prayed for you. Now look at her. Simon, her sins are already forgiven. Listening to her, looking at her and says, now your sins are forgiven. Somehow God works even before we come to him. God predecides that he, this is what I'm going to do with this fellow when they choose to come back to me. So bring your hurts, bring your pain, bring your trauma. He will heal you today. Let's close our eyes. Wherever we are, let's take this, this moment just to offer ourselves to Him and um, receive that healing grace. I give you a moment, and I'm, 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 of course, as the worship team joins us.
would you? Offer, like her, your life to her. As they begin to lead us into a moment of worship, where whether you know the song or not, it doesn't really matter right now to sing, but just let's bring our hurts, our pain to him and lay it at his feet. Let's become desperate. Say, God, I just need, can't live with this anymore can't live with this kind of pain. I, I, I don't want those memories, God. Would you just clean them? Can you do that? He's willing to change your life. grace just as you healed the woman would you choose to heal us God some of us need to be healed we pay too much attention to the voices around us we del dwell too much on our trauma Would you help us, God? Heal us. May your spirit begin his healing process within us. Thank you for those who are here today and praying their prayer to you. Listen to them, God. Those who are online and are praying the same prayer to you. I pray that God, that healing process would begin in them. The scars emotional scars, uh, spiritual scars, even physical scars. Would you heal them completely, God? Restore them. By your grace. Thank you. Thank you, God, for this evening once again, for speaking to us. Even as we go back to our homes, I pray that you would, your presence would continue to be with us. Give us good night's rest. But let your word continue to work within our hearts. May we pay more attention to your voice than the voices around us. Teach us that discipline, God. Thank you.
Till we meet again, may your spirit be with us. When we come tomorrow again, God, I pray that you'd speak more. Um, reveal yourself more, your grace more to us. Help us to be soaked in that grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.